Hello and welcome to the Hustle Over Everything podcast. This is the podcast where you receive stories, tips, and strategies from entrepreneurs who've done it to help you grow your business and take yourself to the next level as a person. Today on the show, we have Michelle Falcon. He is an entrepreneur. He started off at 1-800-GOT-JUNK and built himself out of the company into an agency that has worked with billion-dollar brands focusing on customer experience. So today in the show, we're going to talk about his journey creating that and also how he's been able to create a speaking engagement brand that charges $30,000. So man, I'm excited. If you haven't already, make sure you follow us at 24-7 Hustler. You can find Michelle at Michelle Falcon all across the internet. And let's get into it. Owen, how you doing, bro? My guy, Al, bro. You know, first of all, man, I'm excited for this podcast episode. I've watched Michelle. I uh, do his thing in the city, starting from like hundred, one eight hundred got junk, like you know, as a customer service rep, to yeah. like doing big things, bro. Like he's legit living the dream and showcasing what is possible. But for me, I'm just chilling, bro. I'm happy. I told you earlier, bro. I took my patio furniture out, right? So I've been just kind of. I woke up, bro. The sun was blasting this morning. I just poured like a hot cup of coffee. You know, really thought about everything, reminiscing, just counting my blessings. And, um, man, this is a coronaversary slash our pod, you know, marriage versary. You know what I'm saying, bro? <laughs> like, we've done this for a year consistently. Consistently. Every Monday, episode after episode after episode, like, we showed up, right? Like, that is, that is, we got we to gotta give our pat, ourselves a pat on the back because, you know, it's easy to put up a podcast, but what separates professional podcasters from the wannabes is consistency. Anybody can start a podcast, but it's all about showing up. And I remember I told you my basketball coach early on told me like, Owen, oh, the key thing to success is showing up. How do you show up? If it's practice, you show up. Work, you show up. And it's not physically showing up, but mentally showing up to produce each and every single day. And we've done that, bro. And I'm so proud of us, man. And what I want to ask you, man, is you joining me. I want to ask you, like, Alex, I think we can kill it. We can make a great team together. And to do this after a year, how have you grown as an individual? How have you grown as a podcaster? And what are your favorite things that we've done over this past year? Man, (sighs) that's such a loaded question. So you asked like four questions there. And it was just my, my, my mind was running. I was like, let me just let running. it all out yeah. and just let, let you have the stage after. I didn't want to interrupt you after you have your moment as you're talking. Man, it, it, honestly, it's been a, a wild run, you know, diving into the podcast sphere. You know, not just me. My girl's been in it too. <laughs> She's basically a podcast consultant at this point. <laughs> She's always in the background, like, telling you, like, as a producer, mic check, yo, 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 like, you're saying this. Exactly. You know how producers have, like, the thing in your ear and they're telling you, like, when you're kind of, like, veering off course or whatever? Mm-hmm. Your, your missus has been like that, man. Shout out to Kristen. Exactly. Yeah, she come in, hey, that, that point wasn't right. No, don't say that. You know, or... <laughs> or uh, she's like, that podcast was good. That one, that one right there, that Posse Brunson one, oof, that one was good, you know? So so that was dope. It's, it's really been a, a, a ride, man, um, over the last year. Uh, staying consistent, batching, mm-hmm. content creating. It's, just, it's a job on its own, you know? Mm-hmm. But we've done it. We've grown significantly, dropped a playlist that did numbers for us, you know? The thing just it's jumped on our charts, so... Yeah, I'm, I'm excited for the growth we've shown. I think we've grown as people, as individuals, um, mm-hmm. you know. So I'm, I'm excited for what we have coming next. Honestly, it's hard for me to, to look back. I'm always looking forward, so mm-hmm. uh, I'm excited to what we have coming up more more than what we have done personally. I'm on to like next one. We did Jabril last week. All right, this week we got Michelle. All right, we're gonna do this person next. Like that's what's kind of on my plate. It's hard for me to really like sit back and look at everything because. Then I feel like I'm being stagnant, you know? Yeah. You got to enjoy the destination with anything. And I think I remember I said this in a hustle nation, you know, the journey and the destination are one, right? Like right now we are successful as it is. We are on the journey. And even being on this journey, we're putting puzzle by puzzle by puzzle piece together. And eventually you're going to look back and you're going to see the masterpiece that is the puzzle that you've built up, but you don't know which each piece fits. 
but you have a puzzle piece and you keep it moving, you're going to find a place that clicks for it and that's perfect. And that's what podcasting is. Like, how long did it take me to get my Sony A5, A5 uh, 5100, right? Now, mm-hmm. like, look at me. I'm in HD uh, 1080p. Like, it just looks it looks mint, bro. Before, I was looking toasty. That's yeah. growth. <laughs> you're recording right? on a potato. Yo, potato. Yo, if you look at our Instagram and just scroll to the bottom, you'll see us recording on a potato. It looks horrible. Oh, my God. You know, now, looking back, I actually came across the Christina Aguirre episode, and I was like, man, look at that quality. It looked horrible. Like, you, you you know what which one it was for me was like when you made that uh swish cover like when you're promoting swish's episode and like we had like different off facial expressions and then fit swish's camera was like busted like he, he he was like recording in like horrible lighting yeah and then we were you know i'm just like there i was wearing this blue sweater too funny mm-hmm. enough that i'm actually talking and he was just looking like mad it just looks horrible like it just looks so bad but man one year this time around like now look at us proper setup camera editing doing our own production yeah um so it's great bro it's great man without a doubt man all right so who was the top five let's let's, let's do top five top five top five top five Mm -hmm. top five podcasts who you got number one paul brunson i think he's one of those guests who really shared his story in a way that really resonated with everybody right because he is like he is us in a way that's like way more like he he has years on us right he's worked with oprah he's built a business and he just did it by just following his own gut and just pursuing that and it worked out in his favor number two i loved is this like us together or just in in general in general in general it could be it could be one before i was there uh I'll say Posse Brunson, Suraj talking about venture capital. I think that was really great for the podcast. Um, number three, I'd say Vivian K. I think that was our most like comedic episode talking about business. Uh, number four, I would say Dapo, my episode with Dapo. I really love the way he spoke about failure in a way that he was very proud that he failed and it allowed him to be self-aware and move on. And my last episode, like favorite, favorite one was, I would have to say Pierre, right? And I was actually thinking about Pierre yesterday. Pierre, heartbreak after heartbreak, his daughter, his... Himself. Getting mugged himself, cleaning windows for five bucks to raise money, starting up again to launching his platform to being the first ever black man to raise the most you can on a public forum where you can inv- you can raise money from. He did it to every piece of success he's accumulated so far. And hearing that story that when he was down and out, he had like a vision and he stuck to it and he's living that vision. And being able to have that conversation was very, it was an honor to be honest with you. So those are my top five episodes, bro. What about you? Ah, oh, damn. All right, so we're gonna we're definitely gonna have some overlap. Mm-hmm. Vivian K's up overlap there. for sure. Uh, Policy Brunson's up there. I'm gonna. See, what, else, what else can I say? It was really good. I like Candice's as well because Candice was actually an interesting story. I don't know if the pod knows. You know, uh, we actually we interviewed Candice twice. You know, the first time we interviewed Candice, um, it was cool, but we felt like we didn't get the entire story. And mm-hmm. after she came back on. And we really had a transparent uh, conversation with her, so it was yeah. it was good. And she spoke about you know a, a dark time in her life, which you don't really get from a lot of entrepreneurs when they come on here. That they, they want to you know mm-hmm. give us a highlight reel, but it's really important that we also get to hear um, the the dark times and the come up. So shout out to Candicia. That was a really good conversation. I feel like could help a lot of women, a lot of men too. You know, make it through um, you know their dark times. So that was one that I think is a sleeper. What else is really good? Hmm. Actually, I'm going to say Jabril as well, just because, uh, not even because of the episode, I think it's because of the what the episode represents of, you know, the, the full circle moment of us mentioning. Like for you, right? Yeah. yeah for both of us, because we both met, we met, who have you mentioned as a person that we look up to so far that we've actually gotten to have on the podcast, you know? I'd say like maybe uh, Jabril and Paul. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Because we learned about Paul through about David. from David Mullen. Yeah, from David yeah, yeah, Then yeah, we yeah. saw Paul. And we're like, wow, like this guy would be an amazing mm-hmm. guest. And we know we we just like, hey man, one day it's gonna happen. But to be honest with you, I didn't think it was gonna happen a year later. I I, I thought maybe like year two, three. Who knows? But I just didn't think it happened so fast. I was so caught off guard by it. And yeah, bro. Um, yeah. Him yeah. and Jabril, bro. Yeah, for sure. Those are good, good, great guests that we've gotten. How much is that? That's four. I think that's four. Yeah, yo, you need one more. One more. All right. Oh, Mark. Mark LaFleur. He gave gems. Um, and his was, like, action-packed with just, like, straight LaFleur-Z. content. Yeah, Mark LaFleur was yeah. good. Uh, I think that was uh, a content piece as well that, you know, solidified us as a business entrepreneur podcast as well. I feel like when, when I posted that, I got some feedback of, oh, you guys are, you know, in, starting to make – traction with with real entrepreneurs which makes i hate that though because like just because someone's real money, entrepreneurs yeah, bro <laughs> you know like, I, I hate that it's just bs because like i like, what candy's not a real entrepreneur because she's selling you know hair products or, or you know products are centered on hair it's that people like place what their version of an entrepreneur is and then you have to try and like make I, that I, I, and jump over there yeah like their uh bar but like i hate that but you know at the same time um i think Having him showcase like his his story was was really impactful to people. So I think uh, those were some of the the key ones, you know, to to give a top five. But it's always rotating. It's always rotating. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, some episodes age differently. You know what I mean? Like they just you listen to that after sometimes like damn that was a solid. I don't know. It depends what kind of mood you're in. But you listen to some some pieces of our catalog and you're like wow what a great story right mm-hmm. and Candicia's is one because it just touches that emotional core of like being in a relationship and building a business which is our lives right like we always try for having a partner but how do you manage that and how do you manage the post if it doesn't work out and then building a business like it's 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 mentally draining because a m- business is your whole is what you think about all day all day long and then a relationship too and when one gets hit it impacts another that's a fact that's a fact you know and at the end of the day you know we're entrepreneurs but we're, we're people first we're we're you know husbands wives children you know like we're we're humans first so it's really getting that that blend between the two that um we we get to explore so um i'm happy we we, we get to do that with the show with that being mm-hmm. said man let's get into the business side of that let's get into the business tip of the week Let's go, bro. So, you know, one thing that I keep hearing, you know, I'm on Clubhouse now. We're on Clubhouse now. Oh, by the way, look at that mm. segue. Look at that segu. Shout out to the season in this podcast. Uh, make sure you hop on Clubhouse and, and check us out at Hustle Assembly. We're building out Clubhouse right now. And it's going to be interesting. After almost every podcast, not this one, but after almost every podcast, we're going to start doing Clubhouse Rooms with our guests. So I'm excited to share that with you guys. You know, um, we're building out Clubhouse for real, for real. But uh, on Clubhouse, one of the consistent things that I keep seeing is what's going on with iOS 14 and Facebook ads? What's going on with iOS 14 and Facebook ads? I'm like, all right. And I'm consistently giving the same answer, same answer, same answer. So I want to drive this message home um, that it's not just about, you know, the data that can be lost. It's about, you know, driving more people into your funnel, into your business, into your atmosphere. What I mean by that is, all right, I was 14. For those who don't know, is an update from Apple that's going to uh, notify people that Facebook is tracking them and allow them to opt out. So Facebook will be dramatically hurt and the data that will be shown will be dramatically worse or lower. But the opportunity that you have now is to get more people into your funnel by getting their emails, increasing your AOV, your average order value. These are um, strategies that you can take to increase your business as the iOS 14 update um, you know, affects your Facebook ads because it will. Facebook is preparing you as soon as you log on to the ads manager. It says the iOS 14 update is going to affect your ads. Da, 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 da. You know, so these are some strategies you can take. Um, another one that's very, very popular, and I mentioned this before, I just want to drive the message home again is, you know, um, staying in the platform. Right now, Facebook has shops, Facebook has, um, you know, 
the opportunity to leverage what's on the platform so you can still get as much traffic and as much data as you need while selling your products. So that's the business tip of the week. Increase your AOV, increase your email list. And here, let's get, let's get a little tactical for a quick second. What do I mean by AOV, your average order value? That means increasing uh, the order amounts per purchase. A way to do that is to group things together. Right now, we're working on that with us. Right now, we're, we're grouping um, our sweatpants with our joggers, um, not just to increase the average order value, but to really give you a, a set that you can wear. Um, you know what I'm saying? So the, these are some of the things that you can do to increase your average order value, make more money, and that allows you to add more money to your Facebook ads so you can transact on the front end, and once you get the email, you can transact on the back end as well. So that wraps up my business tip of the week. You know, leverage other platforms, get creative when it comes to your Facebook ads. And if you want to learn more about Facebook ads, hit me up at witmedia.ca or experiencewit.com or DM me straight at Elevated Alexander. Oh, and man is elevated, bruv. Yes, sir. You already know, man. Let's get into you already the know, Alex. I got, I got to give you a shout out too, bro. You know, once again, extremely proud of like everything you're doing with your agency business. You know, educating the masses, bro. I always say you're doing God's work. You know, <laughs> and God's work, God's work is when you see someone who's doing something which they truly believe in. They truly believe in whether it's they have one customer, they have one person vibing with it. Regardless of what they do, they're always gonna keep rocking that, and they believe in that, bro. And seeing that and how people are receptive to you and sharing alex alex has been doing this helping me that is doing like authentic god's work bro it's like what's calling from within and you're putting that out and you're sharing with the world and you're helping people man so you don't know one thing you could have told someone has incrementally added twenty thousands in sales into their business which changed their lives and their families and you never know you never know these things that you never know how powerful your words are and uh yeah bro toast up to you a Bel Air toast to Alex, uh, you know. Appreciate that. You know what I'm saying? And uh, guys, you know what time it is, man. It's me, Mr. Hustle Muscle, here on the mic, ready to give you that Hustle Nation tip of the week. And today, it's actually piggybacking off what Alex is saying, you know, increasing your AOV. And how can you supplement that, right? So today, we're talking about, you know, whatever business you're in, See yourself as a media company also. So we're living in an era where the audience rules everything, right? With the rise of social media, companies are now obliged to use these tools to communicate with their customers. The optics of your social media and the value you provide is extremely important. It allows you to have a two-way dialogue with your customers and audiences. You get to build trust and you build your brand voice. Leveraging content to strategically build your business is how you will organically build your brand and get customers. As I always say, you're always one piece of content from being the talk of the internet. So choose one platform that you can dominate and stay consistent and produce on that. Whether you're in the you're selling oil to to customers for their cars, whether you're a window cleaning business. You know, creating funny content of how like, you know, how, for example, one thing I can think about is, you know, if you use our services and clean so much like a bird will be trying to go through your glass and it's going to be knocked out when they find out it's glass. Right. Like that's funny piece of content that you as a window cleaning business can share. So this is just one example of how you can create content that delivers, you know, either humor or educational value to customers, which allows them to keep them in your mind when they're thinking about their next purchase. So see your business as a media business. You know, when your customers are not purchasing your product, how are you nurturing that relationship to keep them engaged? You know, content will always bridge the gap between them making that first purchase to them making that next one because there's so much noise out here and you always got to keep customers remembering about you and thinking about you and you can create that passive content that, you know, delights them throughout their day. Uh, throughout the day. So tap into things such as podcasts. If your business can have a podcast, have a YouTube show or share, you know, a new thing like Instagram reels or TikToks where you can create like educational content 
and you know provide that entertainment share it with them and one brand that does this really well is twitter i mean uh wendy's on twitter wendy's has built such a powerful brand by you know creating great media content on twitter and it's allowed people to you know interact with their brand and show like how playful they are you know a lot of brands are usually rigid but wendy's is one of those cust- uh, brands that has allowed people to tap into them interact with them and just share great great content that really just delights everybody on their timeline so whatever business you're in think yourself as a media business as well the days of just being a product business and selling are long gone to stay relevant produce content build an audience and nurture that audience every single day to get your next sale and that wraps up the hustle nation tip of the week i am mr hustle muscle wishing you guys a happy monday and let's just get it. All right? Bang, bang. <laughs> he always get me with the bang, bang. <laughs> oh, man. Bang, bang. <laughs> I'm gassed up, bro. All right, let's get into the podcast up. with Michelle Falcon. Let's go. Let's go. Hey, what's up, guys? To support the show for free, Here are some main options. If you're on Apple, make sure you rate and write a review of our podcast. This makes a huge difference and helps support the show. If you're on Spotify, follow us. If you're on Google Play, hit subscribe and auto-download so you'll be notified and have a fresh pod ready to go when we drop. Lastly, make sure you share the podcast on Instagram or whichever social platform you use and tag us. On Twitter, we're at 247Hustlers. On Instagram, we're at 247Hustler. And on Facebook, we're Hustle Over Everything. And now, guys, got to pay attention to this point. We just dropped a new newsletter. It's called The Underrated. It's a weekly newsletter that breaks down untold stories that highlight game-changing business strategies that shape our sports, music, and culture. It drops once a week on Mondays early in the morning to prep you for the week. So subscribe to that, and we'll see you in the pod. Yes, Michelle, welcome to the show. How you doing? I'm well. Thank you uh, for inviting me. It's a it's a pleasure. Awesome, man. So, you know, for icebreaker, I wanna ask you this, and this is good for all of us. You know, we're all gonna answer it. Mm -hmm. You know, what has been the worst job you've had to date, and what was the best job you've had to date? I'll start with the best because it was probably my first, which was McDonald's at uh, 13. Uh, It was the best in retrospect because it taught me a lot. Like, you know, McDonald's as a brand is, you know, dragged through the mud by millions of people for, you know, reasons that we might, be familiar with but i think they get a bad rap like uh they taught me how to manage cash and serve customers and multitask uh their training program is like one of the best um and is a model so that's the best the worst i nothing's really jumping out at me as the worst um i could say the one that i did not enjoy was probably Foot Locker. Um, Foot Locker, hey, you think that he's sitting around Jordan's <laughs> what in the world kicks? Oh, McDonald's what? to Foot Locker? Yeah, I, I'm being honest. Explain like it's just it's just a bunch of standing around, no commission, just hourly rate. It was in a mall that wasn't too uh, frequented, so there wasn't a lot of uh oh. traffic so it was just a bunch of standing around the inventory part was pretty boring to me um and it probably comes down to i didn't like my manager as well what about the Maybe discount were you buying like kicks left right and center or how was the discount back then i didn't have i, I can't remember what the percentage was or what the deal was um but i did buy some some stuff like <laughs> If you look back on it, Foot Locker doesn't break like drop shoes anymore, right? Like yeah. they're the shoes that they have are quite pedestrian, definitely not exclusive. So I, I think I I remember buying LeBron James t shirt 
So this was, I can't remember what year it was, but it was probably the year that his rookie season. 03. Uh, was it 03? Yeah, he came to the league in 03. So it was probably that year. That means it was the year I graduated high school. Maybe it was 04. Yeah, 04. The year three. after I graduated high school. Yeah. But yeah, that was probably the best and the least engaging. Mm. Man, gosh, it was, it was the most boring job. And you didn't even get any shoes from it, too, because you, you said you were at a foreign location. So I know Foot Locker, they, like, geo-target their shoes, right? So if you're, like, in Oshawa, you're not going to get the same sneakers as you would in New Yorkdale, right, if I'm not mistaken. So you could miss out easily. Yeah, I don't know. I, maybe it goes – I don't know how to answer that. Perhaps. Mm-hmm. I believe you. But I don't believe everything anybody to, everybody tells me. Mm. <laughs> awesome. Oh, <laughs> man for me best job or okay so least job that i had fun with man i think it was my paper route when i was like in grade six seven it was my first ever job growing up in sarnia the worst part of it was that i used to like carry like all these papers to deliver it in a different neighborhood and i had to do that all year round. so in the winter it was just the worst so you know like those like grocery carts that you have that you like you know all the grannies like they have so i put all my paper routes in there and then one time i was crossing the road the cart broke down on me as I'm like crossing the lights to go to this other end of the, of the block. And it just like, it was the worst, man. Like my, my hands were cold. Like I had to like cut up the papers out of like the little plastic wrapper thing and then put them in the mailboxes. People haven't shoveled their driveways. Um, it was, it was a tough job. It taught me character. Cause I was only like earning like maybe like a hundred bucks every two weeks. So it taught me like the value of having a dollar. So that was like my worst job I could ever think of my best job um i'd say probably like so far probably the one i had the most fun was at good life fitness uh, doing sales i just met a lot of people i met a lot of connections a lot of contacts uh you have a free gym membership the commission's crazy so so far like and i made like a lot of friends from being a good life and it, and it really helped me get through school uh my manager was very like lenient on things and it was just a fun environment and you're also healthy so those are like my two experiences I can say like, man, that's like the best and the worst case scenario that I've ever had. Gotcha. All right, real quick, you know, I, um, I know we're taking up some time, so I'll, I'll try and go through mine quickly. Uh, my best, I don't know if I'll say best, but my most enjoyable one that mm. I found in, interesting was Ontario Place. It was like a best and worst almost because you're outside all day, but I learned to public publicly speak, which was impressive Um, for me because I, I had a stutter growing up. So having to communicate to like a line of 30, 40 angry moms and dads <laughs> was, it was a trip, you know what I'm saying? So that was, that was good. Um, and I'd say the worst job was working at two guys in a truck, you know, that was, you know, okay. I, I earned my dollar, you, you know, for real I was doing a walk up the top of a walk up and I was carrying down couches, you know, and earning my dollar, you know, that work was hard, you know, like working now, doing podcasting, doing marketing, like that's easy, easy money, man. But compared to that, you know, trying to lift up a a couch down a a walk up, nothing compares, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's get into you though, Michelle. So, you know, you've done a ton of like both labor and non-labor jobs as well, you know, and you've gotten, a bunch of credits under your belt, you know, like being published in uh, Time, Forbes, Inc., you know, uh, but you have humble roots as well. You know, I know you used to work at got 1-800-GOT-JUNK. What was that time in, in your life like? Uh, it was everything. You know, the podcast is hustle over everything. But, you know, for me, it was like 1-800-GOT-JUNK over everything in the sense that uh, it was my MBA. I was in business school for a few semesters. Um with the aspiration to learn how to grow a business one day and, and get into entrepreneurship. And it wasn't really clear, you know, what type of business I would start. I just knew that it would go down that path. I'm not an academic and I don't say that proudly, but it's just not my learning environment. Mm-hmm. So I came across this opportunity to work at a company called 1-800-GOT-JUNK. It was in 2007. And my friend who was working for them in their call center introduced me to the company, just said I was working, he was working there for the summer. Uh, And I was looking for something else outside of, um, I was looking for another way to learn entrepreneurship 
other than in a classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, so I studied the company. That was the year that they were voted the best workplace in all of Canada by McLean's magazine. And I said, you know what, I'm going to go work for them. They are a very entrepreneurial company, great company culture. And I just figured I could learn something here. And not to mention, I would get paid to learn. So mm -hmm. I would contribute to their success. I would work hard, but I would earn uh, that would I would earn an income while learning. So it checked a lot of boxes. And I joined the company in 2007 in the call center, um, answering 100 calls a day. And you know, it, you might think like, why didn't you say that was your worst job, right? Yeah. Like answering 100 calls a day, every day, well, five days a week. Mm -hmm. sometimes my shift started at 4 a.m. It wasn't the worst job because I was learning so much. Mm -hmm. I was learning how call centers worked and, and their involvement within companies and the customer experience. And then, you know, as I grew out of the call center and got promoted into the operations side of the company, I learned how a company grows to become a nine figure, hundred million dollar and above business mm -hmm. through marketing and PR and customer experience and company culture. I learned how the finances, like I, I knew how to read like a P and L statement and balance sheet and like, and I was getting paid to learn all this stuff. Right. But I took the initiative to, to learn because I knew that like, I'm going to be here for X amount of years. I didn't know how many years it eventually ended up being five years, but I was like, I'm going to soak up all this education. And I was kind of like, I can't believe I'm getting paid to learn all this stuff where the alternative was paying to acquire a tenth of the knowledge that I was getting at 100 Got Junk. And that was through post-secondary. And I'm not here to, to you know, belittle post-secondary education and university and college. Like, I, I have no intention of doing that. It just wasn't for me. Um, but if it's for other individuals, you know, all the power to you. Like, I um, mentor a couple people that are in business school at Ryerson. And I don't ever tell them, hey, you should drop out. Don't, you know, <laughs> don't always listen to what I say, right? Like, don't yeah. always listen to what Alex says or what Owen says. Like, mm -hmm. listen and then do your own due diligence and come to your own conclusion, right? So that's one thing that I always, uh, what I actually learned at One Hand You Got Junk as well, too, is ask mm -hmm. good questions, mm -hmm. um, be curious. And um, yeah, my my time at One Hand You Got Junk was, was phenomenal. And mm -hmm. um Everything I did after that, I could draw like a line back to my time at 1-800-GOT-JUNK. And like, this isn't a sexy company. This isn't mm -hmm. Nike. This isn't Lululemon. This is a junk removal company. Exactly. But that's a testament to how they made themselves appealing to the media because they, mm -hmm. they were on Oprah. They were on every in every business publication. Yeah, the podcast. entrepreneurs were like being heralded as like great entrepreneurs for starting a simple concept and how the business grew. I remember seeing like a TV show about that. Yeah, and and keep in mind too, guys, like it's a true entrepreneurship story. Mm -hmm. The founder of the company owns a. I, last time I checked, owns a hundred percent of it no outside venture capital. Whereas mm -hmm. like everybody now is like, Oh, you raised a million bucks. Congratulations. Like you're doing awesome. That doesn't mean you're doing awesome. If you raise money, as a matter of fact, yeah. it means you gave up equity in your company. You don't own all of it anymore. You got to give it back. Well, you're going to have to, you give know, yeah, you need a liquidation event. The mm -hmm. person that writes you that check to invest in you, they expect you to write a check back plus, plus, plus. So you know, that's why I liked when I got junk. It was a true business with mm -hmm. profit, with, you know, with the own, the founder owning the majority of it, if not all of it. So, yeah. um, you know, we don't always have to learn from the companies that we read about all of the time in the media, whether it's Netflix and, or Starbucks, two companies that I absolutely love, but like mm -hmm. try to find some, there's companies in your city that nobody's ever heard of that are doing phenomenal try to find some learnings from those companies as well. So like, I remember I was listening to one of your interviews and uh, one of the things that you were saying uh, was you, as you were working on 1-800 is you kept asking yourself like, why not me? Right. Um, this is one thing you kept asking, like, why not me? Uh, talk more about that. What did you mean by why not me? And what were you looking forward to when you're asking yourself this question? 
if it's been done before, it can be done as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, that's not just my professional life. That's my personal life. That's, you know, my personal life being like um, health, Mm -hmm. right? Why can't I squat 315 pounds? Why can't I build a billion dollar company? Why, you know, if it's been done before and I have the attributes to uh, that, I believe I have the attributes to make it happen, Mm -hmm. then why not me? And guys, like this still, this isn't just a 1-800-got-junk thing. This carries on to my everyday it's life. It's like just thing, yeah. 100%. I'm 35 now. You know, my life is much different than it was at 1-800-got-junk. There's some commonality still. However, uh, just last week, I was having a tough day. Like I'm, I'm trying to build this next business. And as a solo founder, it's, it's hard. Like there's, I have to manage everything. And I had to, you know, my fiance, Sophia was like, just go for a walk. And, you know, so I went for a walk and I just kept repeating to myself, like, why not me? Why not me? This is going to be hard. You know what you signed up for? Why not me? Just keep going, keep going. Today's Monday. I feel good. I know what I need to get done, but there's going to be those moments where you're just like, I can't do this. Or like, so, I don't think I can do this. Yeah. yeah. Self, self-doubt self isn't a bad thing. Like it's uh, it recalibrates you, right? It give, makes you take a s- step back and kind of give your head a shake, mm-hmm. but yeah, why not me? Like if it's been done before um, you could do it, you can do it as well. And that's not supposed to be some platitude or some quote that goes on a wall. It's just honest, right? Like why not me? Yeah, man. So after that, was this when you started um, your agency? Uh, so in 2012, I um, left when I had to got junk mm-hmm. and I gave two months notice. You know, most people give two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> Sometimes they give nothing. Right. Yeah. But for me, I, I took a lot of pride in the work that I had done. And I wanted to make sure that there was a good transition to the next person that was going to be replacing me. So I gave two months and that's a lesson to everyone. Like if, if, if you want to maintain strong relationships in your professional life, don't make the company's operations more difficult by abruptly leaving. Mm-hmm. Like I think two weeks is, is even too little. I would offer four weeks. If you have any sense of pride in your work and what you're leaving behind and in and, and the relationships you've built, that's my recommendation. Uh, but in 2012, I had left to start a, an agency um, and it wasn't glamorous. Like it wasn't an agency with a big office and everything. It was me in the house that I'm actually taking this call from because mm-hmm. this is my family home in, yeah. in Vancouver. And in 2012, I had to move back home because I was like, all right, this is kind of start up. I don't know when my next paycheck is going to be. Uh, but I started an agency to help companies of different industries and different sizes improve the relationships they have with their customers and their employees and build their company culture. So essentially companies would come to me to help them build their training programs, um, help them develop their core values and and mission statements. Uh, I would work on some customer experience stuff. um, And that was really cool. Like I, but very like, I would be lying to you if there weren't days where I'm like, I don't know when my next check's coming or how I'm earning income this month. Mm. And that went on for, I think, three to six months, maybe closer towards six months after leaving when I had to go junk. Man, it was humbling. Um, Worrisome too. Like I thought like maybe I made the wrong decision. Maybe I need to go work for another company. But Eventually, my first client was Ferguson Moving and Storage. They paid me $3,000 to develop their entire training program for their movers. So it's funny, Alex, that you mentioned two guys in a truck. So I know the moving industry inside and out as well. Um, but don't ever ask me to, to, to help you move ever. Um, because I'll say no, like a friend, the many years ago, the friend, a friend asked me, can you help me move? I didn't respond to his text. I just e-transferred him a hundred bucks and said, here, some money to buy a mover and don't ever ask me to help. (laughs) It's just not a good use of anybody's time, right? Like, let's just all come together and chip in and we'll hire some movers for you. Mm -hmm, Uh, mm -hmm. but don't ever ask me to move. Um, 
So the agency um, started off Ferguson Moving and Storage and Lauren McKinnis. I will never forget his name and his business because, guys, I, I, yes, I moved back home. And yes, I had, you know, a roof over my head, thankful for my parents. There's food in the fridge. But I was like, man, creditors are calling. I got max out credit cards. And he wrote that $3,000 check to give me a lifeline. All right. Um, let's, break, let's break this down because this is where a lot of people are. A lot of people have lost their jobs due to Corona. And yeah. they're at home. They're trying to make something happen, right? So you reached out to this guy, LinkedIn, direct cold call. It was a cold call. A um, cold call. It was a cold call. Textbook and, uh, cold call, man. Yeah. And, I, you know, 1-800-GOT-JUNK has some Gave clout. You the calls. Yeah. Right? So when I mentioned 1-800-GOT-JUNK, they were like, oh, okay, I know that company. I respect that company. So I leveraged my tenure at 1-800-GOT-JUNK as a sales tool. Um, but yeah, I, I called Lauren, um, and truth be told, I'll I'll tell the story, the real story. Um, I called him from the office of 1-800-GOT-JUNK before I had left before my last day, but during that two month period Mm -hmm. and, um, he was like, oh, I know 1-800-GOT-JUNK. So I was already selling before I left. Smart. But this, the, but it didn't close. And I think I took my lunch break or something. I was like, okay, I, during this lunch hour that I have, I'm going to be calling people to build my sales funnel. Mm-hmm. So the day that I leave, hopefully I have some sales. But that sale didn't close until I, I think it was between three and six months after I left when I had got junk. So I went months without income, mm-hmm. um, you know, like, and I was in my mid 20s. What do you do in your mid twenties when you have friends? You're going to bars. You're going to, you know, you're being social. I didn't have yeah. any of that, man. I remember my parents like feeling bad for me one New Year's even like gave me a hundred bucks and said go out, right? Like it was, it was bad. Damn. Bro. Um, yeah, and you know my parents are the most kind people uh, you'll ever meet, and uh, they sorted me out. They gave me an opportunity, and yeah, it was you know the why not me. Mm-hmm. Man, I, I was telling myself that for months. And eventually it was like, maybe it's not me. <laughs> maybe it's yeah. not me, right? Um, and that worry came. You know, there was that worry. There was that concern. But then things started happening, mm-hmm. right? Like I, I did the work for Lauren. I did some mm-hmm. really good work. Um, and then I just started getting referrals. You know, a thousand bucks here, fifteen hundred dollars mm-hmm. here. Um, my first keynote speech was for three thousand dollars us so that's like what 10 canadian um (laughs) but um three thousand us in boston uh a woman named judy briggs Mm -hmm. who ran the franchise the boston franchise of 1-800 god junk she uh was a part of entrepreneurs organization eo the Mm -hmm. boston chapter and she said come to come to uh, boston um come give a talk to our group Mm -hmm. about what you know in regards to calls your customers and employees and um we'll pay for your flight and your accommodation i was like wow this is like a hundred percent profit and uh she's like what do you charge i was like my head i'm like i don't i don't know right uh but i was like three thousand she's like sure i was like damn I should have went for five. Should have went higher. <laughs> I know. Hold on. Yeah, play yeah, it back. Yeah. Play it back. Play it back. Let's do, do let's do a do-over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, I started getting testimonials. My website for my agency was, you know, looked like a business. Mm-hmm. Right. There was testimonials from people. Um, and then um did you want me to carry on question? Yeah. Like as, uh, as you're talking, right? So you went to start this agency and now like you're known as this like customer experience, engagement, uh, centricity, everything. Mm-hmm. Um, what, I mean, so this is 2009, right? 2012 ish. No, no, this period of time is 2012 to 2016. Yeah. So at the time, right? Like this whole customer experience was really being championed and, uh, like, but what gave you that insight to really cultivate your business to become the guy in this space, right? Because people sure. really had no customer experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you really took it as, as by storm and you believe that 
these are the growth strategies. These are the next steps towards yeah. building a business. Like, how did you, what insights did you see that gave you that, you know what, this is the next wave and I'm going to be that guy to be educating mm-hmm. people and teaching them how to do this for their businesses. Okay. So to answer that question, I got to take you back to that first era during my yeah. time. I want to hear you got Chuck. So 2007, I joined the company. Didn't really know like what was going to come of this other than you're going to learn a lot and mm-hmm. you'll figure it. It's something will present itself and you'll be an expert in that. Mm-hmm. 2008 was the recession. Um, thankfully I dodged three rounds of layoffs because you know, I was doing well at my job. Mm-hmm. 2008 was the year I read Gary Vaynerchuk's Crush It book. So his first book. So I was, you know, all the young cats are on Gary V. You could fall on Gary V right now. I was there early, right? 2008, I read his book. I was like, okay, I got to find something and make it mine, right? Like what subject am I going to be the expert in? Still didn't know, but I, I was alert. I was looking for it. 2009. I was introduced to a company, maybe end of 2008. I was introduced to a company called Zappos.com. They grew from a million to a billion in sales in 10 years. I was like, that, that's a good business, right? That's fast growth. And if you go back and read any PR that they got and at that time, 2008, 2009, It was always about customer experience. It was always about company culture. They were pounding their chest. And I knew this because 1-800-GOT-JUNK was doing the same, but they were doing it in the US and they were getting a ton of PR for this. So I was like, you know what? Customer experience is going to be the thing. PR, marketing, finance, all that stuff is very important to business. But I saw this opportunity. I was like, nobody's really focusing on this. Like Mm -hmm. today, when you think about digital marketing, Mm -hmm you'll think Gary Vaynerchuk. If you think of hospitality, you might think Danny Myers, right? So there's a subject and then a personal brand that will naturally come to you. Exactly. Yeah. So I was like, I'm going to be the customer experience person. I don't care if you know my name or not. I just, when somebody thinks customer experience, I want them to be like that guy, mm-hmm. right? So I soon realized that you can't have a great customer experience without having a customer centric culture. Mm -hmm. And you can't have a great customer experience if you have a bad employee experience. So I created this whole model uh, and framework around leveraging those three things, company culture, employee engagement, and customer experience. Now, even to this day, guys, like not many people know, like they know what those words mean or Pardon me, maybe not even not. They're familiar with the words. Exactly. But what is it really? Essentially, if you want your employees or your customers to genuinely like doing business with you and Mm -hmm. grow it for you, well, you need some systems and processes in place that are happening behind the scenes to make that happen. And, you know, I could go deep on that, but we'll be on here for hours and hours and hours if I was to do that. But that in short is what it is. Mm -hmm. Um, So then I said, I'm going to be that guy. And then I heard Gary Vaynerchuk got paid at the time, got paid $30,000 a speech um, to be a keynote speaker. It's now a hundred K. And I was like $30,000 for a one hour talk. And now there's, you know, there's commuting time and preparation and so forth. But I was like, I want that one day, Mm -hmm. but I got to start somewhere. And I gave my first talk for free. It cost me $3,000 because they didn't pay for my flight. They didn't pay for my accommodation. I hired a videographer um, to uh, record it. So I had a highlight reel uh, because I knew one day I wanted to get paid and I needed Mm -hmm. stuff for my website to market that service. Um, But it was in Richmond, Virginia. And I gave my first talk for free. Again, well, lost money. Um, But then the Boston engagement came. And then things started happening from there. I got the Boston speaking engagement. And then, you know, fast forward, I think a year, we're probably in 2013 now. Verizon Wireless, the $100 billion telecom company, found me by doing a Google search because they were looking for a speaker in um, for their, their manager meeting um, of their Western region retail stores. And I was like, okay, I need to know, I need to charge more than 3000. Mm-hmm. 
And I was like, what do I charge these people? I was like, 20,000 US? I like held my breath and I like just waited for the email response to be like, either like, screw you or we're in. They're like, okay. And, and, and I was like, oh. and, and I was like, okay, now wow. I got to figure out how to give a $20,000 speech. But so I, during that period of 2012 to 2016, it was, it went from, I'm getting stepped on. I don't have any money. Mm-hmm. I probably, I think I've made the wrong decision mm-hmm. um, to just getting a little bit of momentum and building off of that and building off of that and building off of that. Guys, like I, I don't, I'm not on this podcast because I have an MBA. I'm not on this podcast because I can, you know, put together a Rubik's cube really quickly, or I have this crazy IQ. It's just, I believe in myself and you know, I'm, I'm, I play the long game as well. I'm not expecting results in 12 months every single time I do something new. I know sometimes it could be take three to five years. And um, I, I now charge close to $30,000 a speech. And remember, in 2009, I idea. said I wanted to charge $30,000. 11 years later, I finally achieve that 11 years so how'd that you know, feel how'd that feel like when you first realized that dream of like you know i'm an established speaker yeah uh, you know what man i have no feeling toward that and 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 i'll tell you why yeah i don't take a victory lap often mm-hmm. and sometimes people say that's not good for you you mm-hmm. should enjoy your accomplishments mm-hmm. like i was talking to sophia with my my fiance the other day and i was like i'm 35 and i feel like i haven't really accomplished anything um and part of me knows that i'm lying to myself when i say that because i have and um but it's not enough right you, like yeah i was it, gonna say do you feel like you've lived that thought so much in your mind that you already felt like you already assumed you have it for so long that when it happened, it's just kind of like, yeah, I knew it was going to happen. Like type of feeling. Yeah. I do know everything's going to happen because I'm so fixated on it. I've become Mm -hmm. obsessive with it. Um, And I think that's a recipe for success, like law of attraction and just, you know, LeBron James knew he was going to win a championship. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and he controlled everything he could to make that happen from how much he exercised, how much he invested into making sure he was healthy and many other things. Mm -hmm. And I take the same approach in that, like, it's going to happen. I don't know when, but I'm going to do absolutely everything to control every variable that I can to make it happen. Mm -hmm. So now I have a new set of goals I'm very clear on what they what they are. I don't know when it's going to happen, but I know it's going to happen. Uh, real quick, you know, going back to like the being 35 and the feeling that I've accomplished anything. Do you think it could have been not feeling fulfilled with what you accomplished, and maybe not like having your why completed? Like I haven't really reached my why. Yeah, that's a little. That's definitely a little bit of it. You know, I was doing the consulting from 2012 to 2016. And then 2016, I moved unexpectedly from Vancouver to Toronto. Uh, my business partners, uh, well, my business partners now um, asked me to do some consulting work for them. So when I, somebody that I knew um, asked me to move to Toronto temporarily to do some consulting work for them on the subject matters that I was an expert in. Mm-hmm. Three months turned into six months. Six months turned into, do you want to buy into our hospitality company and help us grow this? We have a vision to open up multiple properties and let's do it. Uh, So I said, you know what? Let's do it. I'm in. Um, I was a bit disengaged from the consulting work because I was working by myself. I missed being part of a team like I had at 1-800-GOT-JUNK. Um, and it was becoming easy to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I knew what to do, how to do it uh, for any company of any size. And, 
you know, I was helping them grow their business. I wasn't necessarily growing mine the way that I wanted to. So I joined um, my partners now um, and grew this hospitality company from zero dollars in revenue and zero employees to fifteen million dollars a year in revenue and one hundred and fifty employees, a little bit more than that, um, between the years of two thousand seventeen and 2019. So we grew really quick. And that was, um, that was uh, another chapter, if you will, in yeah. the trajectory of my career. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then I became disengaged again. And well, to your before Mike, uh, yeah, uh, no, 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 you gotta walk us through that. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 hospitality. No, no. Let's let's Daniel let's break Stone down. We have that. a lot of Toronto listeners, and I'm sure this group owns a lot of the venues that you know we frequently. So, like, break down this hospitality group. Like, what sure. venues, what restaurants yeah. do you guys own? And yeah, and so how yeah. did you get from zero to fifteen million? Because there's a lot of strategy you guys must have implemented from early on, Alex. So yeah. That's what you wanted to say too, right? For sure, for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, they're all located on King Street or just off of King Street in Toronto. There's Barrow, there's Escobar, uh, which is at 485 King Street West. Um, then Petty Cash came after that, which is on Portland and Adelaide. And those two venues opened up in a two-year period, and, and we experienced that growth that I just mentioned. Um, I knew that the growth was going to come quick. Like borrow needed to hire a hundred employees to open. And if we were going to build this experience that Owen and Alex loved and really came back and frequented again and again, our employees had to be, you know, high quality, really committed team members. So we didn't hire the first hundred people that interviewed with us. Like we met hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people and eventually hired the hundred that we believed were the best fit for their roles and for the culture. So, you know, there was a lot that went on. Uh, my business partner, Maddie, who, who I believe has been on the, on the podcast with you guys and I met last week and we were kind of reminiscing about what we did, like there was a total of 25 um, strategies that I deployed um, in the beginning of the, in the first year. And in retrospect, that was too much. Like it almost killed me. What are some of the things that we did is like, you know, hospitality is known as very transient industry. You kind of go from bar to bar, restaurant to restaurant. So I knew I had to build a, an interview process that was robust uh, so that we didn't just hire the first person that you know, we said hello to, or to move away from asking an interview question like, when can you start? Oh, tomorrow you're hired, right? Like, mm. and, and companies, you know, still hire that way in some for some, some respects. Uh, and they wonder why they have bad customer service. Well, cause you have high employee turnover and your employees aren't engaged. And it's quite simple. Uh, why, you know, it's very easy to identify your issue. Um, so, you know, we, we built these systems and processes, grew really quickly. Our customers loved us. They loved the experience. Our employees, I would like to believe, um, really enjoyed working with us. Uh, we helped grow a lot of careers, uh, individuals that have, are still with the company um, and will still be with the company after this pandemic passes. Um, so that, you know, in short guys is, is how we grew so quickly. You know, there's another thing to be recognized. Like we had a product that people wanted, um, you know, entertainment, ambiance, um, and we coupled that by having a strong culture and, uh, that's what built the foundation of our company to enjoy that success. Um, I had the opportunity to open up another venue uh, with our partners, which was called Dasha, another large format restaurant. So keep in mind, guys, when I say restaurant, it's this isn't one floor, you know, small 2,000 square feet. It's yeah. it's massive. Like they're one venue, 16,000 square feet. The next venue is 7,000 square feet. The Dasha is 9,000 square feet. So I had an opportunity to join my partners in Dasha as well, but um I decided that 
I wanted to, to do something else. Um, and that next thing is, is starting this year. And I'm very confident that this will be the last thing that I do in my career, which will take me, you know, decades beyond today. Q, Q, uh, I have an idea of what that is, but I, I want to hear from you. So what is that next thing? Uh, yeah, it's a, a Peruvian inspired fast casual restaurant brand. Um, I want to do for Peruvian food, mm-hmm. what Starbucks did for Italian coffee, what Chipotle did for Mexican mm-hmm. is popularized these products mm-hmm. and this service offering by creating a brand. Mm-hmm. So I am Peruvian Canadian or Canadian Peruvian, which whichever way is correct. Um, my parents are, are, are you born, born here? I was born in Canada. Yeah, I was born in Edmonton. So, um, so, so Canadian Peruvian. I'm Canadian, Canadian, I'm Canadian Jamaican, and they they gonna remind me every time. Yeah. So yeah, the, I, I can I can claim Kenyan Canadian because I was born and raised in Kenya. Then I moved to Canada. Got oh, it. So, shut up. Shut up. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, right, so I know how great Peruvian food is, and you know, um, I'll give you a couple little tidbits of information that will make you be like really i didn't know that okay so i see the balls of bel-air in the background right that's part of popular culture Mm -hmm. nobu is also the restaurant is also part of popular culture you know Mm -hmm. drake raps about nobu Mm -hmm. um nobu is a japanese peruvian restaurant known as nikkei chef nobu got his start in cooking in the 50s in peru so that, along with Chef Gordon Ramsay, Anthony Bourdain, when he was alive, have all heralded Peruvian food. Um, two of the world's Michelin star restaurants are in Lima, Peru. They're called Maido and Central. Peru has 45 different hundred types of potatoes, making them the potato capital of the world. They're the second largest exporter of quinoa. They are a massive exporter of mangoes, asparagus, avocados. Because of their climate, they're able to create these or grow these superfoods and super fruit that the world's never really heard of. But you've probably um, had it before. Fruit like lucuma and chirimoya and, and all of these things that when you try it, you're going to be blown away. The problem is that Peruvian food has not been marketed properly to the North American uh, region. Mm-hmm. And when I say properly, it's no disrespect to all the Peruvian chefs who have done their things and built great restaurants. They, they have, and, I, I'm, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful. It's just that why hasn't Alex or Owen had Peruvian food? I'm assuming that you haven't. I can't even remember the last time I ate Peruvian food. I don't even know what it looks like, to be honest. Right. With so you sure. haven't. You have, yeah. right? Like it's either yes or no, right? Like, have you had Greek food? Yeah, oh. definitely, Mr. Greek. There, you, if, Alex, have you had Italian food? Hold on, hold on. First things first. Are we going to count Mr. Greek as as, as Greek food? <laughs> no, Rob, Rob. Listen, I I, I go to <laughs> Pape and Danforth. I've eaten there, but like, I think right, what right. Michelle is saying. Yeah, yeah. So the but you sure. you ha- yes, you you're Italian very clear. I, I've had Italian. I've had Japanese. I've had um, Greek food. And then with proven food, the reason you probably haven't had it before is because of access. There are many proving restaurants in the GTA, but they're full service restaurants, which require an hour, hour and a half, maybe even two hours to enjoy. As much as you like to believe you are an adventurous eater, you're not, right? Nobody really is for the most part. Because when Alex and Owen and anybody else want to go for dinner, how often do you go for dinner these? Well, it's a bad, bad description right now or bad question given the pandemic. But you don't go out to dinner every night, right? It's still a treat. Mm-hmm. So when you go for that treat where you might spend $100, are you going to go to the new Peru, the Peruvian place that some people have told you about, which you're not 100% guaranteed you're going to like it? Or are you going to go to the Italian place that you know, or the Jamaican place that you know, yeah. um, you have familiarity with? You're going to go with that place, right? 
So what I'm trying to build is solve that challenge and market North American food in a fast, casual way. So we're going to have salads and we're going to have warm bowls that have proven flavors. So we're going to attract you with familiarity. Oh, with baby spinach, with quinoa, with mm -hmm. chicken, with short rib. But we're going to include proving flavors subtly mm. so that it's not, you know, food's emotional. Yeah. If you see something you're not familiar with, you're like, Ooh, I don't think I'm going to get that. Right. Mm. I'm just going to go to tried and true where I yeah. know that I like the food. So because food's so emotional, it needs to be marketed very, you know, delicately there's that that relationship is quite fragile between consumer and new food um so if you've eaten at chipotle expect brasa peruvian kitchen the brand that i'm building now to be like a chipotle but instead of mexican substitute peruvian flavors there and that's what the brand is and we're going to start in toronto and my expectation is we get to a, over a thousand stores by when um well, I've told my uh, investors that I'll get to 100 stores within five years. Um, I don't have a timeline for 1,000 stores, but that's the goal. And, you know, the why not me? If Chipotle has been built, Chipotle has, I believe, 2,500 stores leveraging Mexican food, which is great. I love Chipotle. Chip I'm, I'm a huge Chipotle fan. Um, and, and get offended when people actually uh, badmouth them, even though they'll be a future competitor. Yeah. But if they can get to 2,500 stores leveraging Mexican food, uh, if I market this brand properly, I can get there too. Uh, mm -hmm. It'll take some time. It's going to be very painful along the way. I'm going to feel like I'm getting stepped on maybe every week. And, uh, uh, but I, I believe, I believe in myself. I believe in the concept and, and I believe most importantly, I believe that Alex and Owen are going to love this food and they're going to come back once a week. I believe that, our employees are going to love working for us, man. There is nobody better to build this type of culture than me. And I say that humbly, but man, this, there's a decade of learning that is now going to be poured into this brand. Yeah. And part of the reason why I ventured off on my own, like guys, when I was building the restaurants uh, from 2016 to 2019, um, I had a book come out in 2018. I was mm -hmm. speaking. I was, I was, I was going to make five hundred thousand dollars a year, easy. You would think I, I was happy, and and I was. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But it, that just goes to show money isn't everything. Um, I had uh, I had a little hole in me that wasn't being served, and look, don't get me wrong. I want that 500,000 to one day be 500 million, of course. but it's not what drives me. It's an outcome that I want. Like I want nice things. I want nice things for my mom, for my dad, for my sister, for my future uh, parents, uh, uh, parents-in-law, mother and father-in-law, mm -hmm. my fiance, and, and I'll get it and I'll earn it. But it's not what I think about when I wake up in the morning. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, what I think about when I wake up in the morning is how can I build this company culture where employees are the most important part to this? And because of that, mm -hmm. they do such great work that they produce a product every day that Alex and Owen love. And mm -hmm. Alex and Owen love this brand because they introduce them uh, or we introduce them to Peruvian food. And maybe one day Alex and Owen travel to Peru because we taught them about the country and the culture. And they're like, that place looks awesome. I have to go there. That is one of my definitions of success mm -hmm. is if I can get you to like Peruvian food so much that you actually book a trip to Peru and enjoy it and come back and say, that was the brand that introduced me to the country of Peru. And I loved my time there. I met a woman there and I married her or whatever the case might be. That's where the 500 million comes from. That's where the billion dollar uh, brand comes from. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the long game, right? Like yeah. stop scrolling Instagram and watch, stop following Grant Cardone and, and people like this and expecting you to have, expect yourself to have a private jet uh, or, uh, or all this stacks of cash within a year. Like it's going to take time, right? And be patient. You've got time. Mm -hmm. Thanks, man. For sure, man. Um, I know like um, we're 
running up on time here, but there's one thing we spoke about earlier on when we chatted, uh, the work that you're currently doing right now, which is uh, the feeling of you're educating people. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm trying to look at my notes of what I wrote, but uh, educating people on fulfillment and why certain people excel at certain things and why some people don't. Um, Can you speak more about that initiative and what you're doing with that? Yeah. uh, Last year, um, I was trying to figure out what type of messaging I'm going to have for my personal brand, for my Mm -hmm. podcast, for my keynote speeches. And I'm still going to deliver the message to entrepreneurs and business leaders and what type of strategies that I'm using to get customers and employees to fall in love with the brand that I'm building. Um, But I also wanted to create a message, which I, I have, it's called steer your career. I want to talk to the 21 year old Michelle, right? Like what type of message would I have loved to listen to when I was sitting in the call center, when I had got junk, looking to hustle, looking to earn more income and so forth. So that's some of the content that I'm going to be building um, starting in February, 2021 um, is how can I help entry level employees and first time managers level up their career and grow. Like I I've, I'll probably have a podcast episode, a solo episode called, you know, titled like how to ask for a raise properly. Um, And, you know, things that you can do for free to educate yourself, right? Like remember my time in 2008 to 2012 or Mm -hmm. 2007 to 2012, when I was at one hand, I was just reading and reading and listening and reading and listening. And that's where I came across Zappos. And because of Zappos, I figured out what my, expertise was going to be so you know what it is is it's paying paying it forward right like i welcome people calling me or emailing me and i have a call with them if they want to quote unquote pick my brain uh because guess what i was the young professional looking to get some advice um so you know shame on anybody that will say i'm too busy you're not too busy you're not that important right? Everybody has the time to 30 minutes a week, right? Give, donate your time to somebody um, to educate them. And because you were that person one time asking for somebody's ear as well. And shame on you if you say you're too busy. Um, You're not too busy. You're just choosing not to do it. You have the time. You're just choosing not to. That's a fact. That's a fact. Oh, one thing yeah, I want to go and, and I'm going to I'm going to start calling people out like that say I'm too busy, I'm too busy. Like I I have like personally, not on social media, but to friends, they're like I was like, "Hey man, you got to you got to educate that next generation of of leaders, like pay help them pave their path." Um cuz I'll always remember when I was flat broke before Lauren McKinnis wrote that $3,000 check, just like, man, tears broken wow. Wow. yeah for real like you can ask my mom she'll tell it you it was that deep eh? i thought you know, from the sense early on i was talking yeah yeah you're down but i didn't know it no, was no, that, no. that deep. Ho- hollow man just stressed didn't want to answer my phone because it could be a creditor De- you know i had payday loans um what a shit industry that is uh but like payday loans that were due max still credit cards like it was bad it was everything that you know it was um i felt like um, you know, Will Smith in pursuit of happiness, mm-hmm. just like getting stepped on, just bad news, bad news, bad news, bad news. But now that I look back on it, that was building my grit and my resilience because I didn't give up. I was getting stepped on every day, it felt like. And then, but I still kept working, so I kept trying and trying and trying and trying. And then I got my break, that $3,000 check, and then things started happening. That's amazing, man. That's absolutely amazing. Um, uh, right, as we work towards wrapping up, you know, I want to ask this question. What do you look for that separates good employees from bad employees? Or was that need more training? Grit and perseverance. Like, look, I can yeah. teach you. I can teach you to do X, Y, Z. Now, it depends on the field, right? Like, I can't teach an engineer to engineer without any engineering background but for my industry or for you guys in in doing your you know marketing and so forth like 
you can teach somebody how to buy Facebook ads, right? You can teach people how to blog, um, but you can't teach people grit and perseverance, but you can. Um, and a lot of things just stem from that. Um, and it, that is what I'm looking for. Right. Because if you have grit and perseverance, you're going to get back up when you're inevitably knocked down. Um, I also feel like individuals that have that have a strong sense of pride in what they do, how they carry themselves. Um, they're not the type of individuals to show up late to work. Um, you know, even if they're a prep cook, and they're cutting carrots. They have a sense of pride that they're going to do it properly because that's what they do. That's the type of brand that they want to build for themselves. It's like that person, Sally or Mark, um, everything that they do is exceptional and it doesn't have to be glamorous. It could yeah. be as simple as chopping carrots and doing it properly every single day. And then because Sally does it so well, I start as the leader of the company, I'll start building confidence. Uh, she starts building confidence in me uh, when I think of her. And then she'll get an opportunity to be promoted and earn more money. And then maybe she becomes a vice president of marketing one day at Brasa. Mm -hmm. She started off as a prep cook, right? Like, but it all stems from grit and perseverance. And yeah. I believe that that is near and dear to my heart because I believe I have that. And that's what's allowed me to, to achieve the, some of the success I've achieved. Um, yeah, that's how I would answer that. Yeah, they always say the difference between uh, good to great is the little things, right? Um, how you do one thing is how you do the next thing. And yeah. there's one quote Steve Jobs uh, said when he was like working with his dad, they were building like a barn and his dad really emphasized on, hey, the person on the outside will not see the way you cut this piece of wood that connects us, but you have to really cut it, at, even though it fits, but you have to really measure it, make sure it's accurate because even though you can't see it, you can feel it. And that's the thing with Apple products, like on the outside, you see this beautifully designed MacBook, but the experience comes from internal, like the, the experience you get from using it, the, the UX, the way you can click X on a certain screen and it's still open. These are certain principles that Steve was trying to bring to his team. It's like, hey, let's go the extra mile and do this the right way, even though we can do it good, but do it extra, extra good because it's all about what the person feels, not what they can really see when they're playing with your product or using your product. Yeah, no, definitely. How you, how you do something is how you do everything. And, and I, I bring that into my personal life as well. Mm -hmm. You know, if uh, it's Sunday night and I've got a load of laundry, I still have to do. I'm like, oh, I'll just do it tomorrow. I'll be like, no, I'm going to do it tonight because I said I was going to do it tonight. And I told Sophia I was going to do it tonight. Mm -hmm. Right. So if I'm at the gym and I want to hit that last rep, I could easily say, ah, don't worry about it. No, like if I say I'm going to do something, work hard, I'm going to work, pardon me, work hard in everything that I do. And it's actually a lesson that I'm really looking for, you know, if and when I have kids, it's, it's one of the things that I'm going to um, really teach them that kind of like do or do not, right? You're either going to do it or you're not going to do it at all. And that's fine. Just don't tell somebody you're going to do something, especially don't tell yourself that you're going to do something you don't. Oh yeah, for sure, man. That's the worst. That's a fact. Yeah. Everybody uh, does it. it. All right. That's a beautiful note to, to wrap on. You know what I'm saying? Um, sorry, did I cut you off? My apologies. No, I was going to say it was my pleasure. Awesome. Awesome. Where can people find you? I have been blessed and cursed with this unique name. So I'm Michelle Falcon everywhere from website to social. Um, so just, if you're interested in learning more, just go to google.com, throw my name in there and You'll that'll, come up. Yeah, I'll come up LinkedIn, yeah. Facebook, Instagram, boy, website, just start there. Amazing. And with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, that wraps up the show. The house is what you can't control. So control your grind. I control your life. I'm Alex. And I'm Owen. We up? <laughs>
you know, usually we'd say, and I'm, uh, and I'm Michelle, right? So. Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> I know, I know. It's like an inside <laughs> joke we do. Oh, do you want me to say it so you can clip it together? Do it up, man. Go, go for it. You can keep it. It's all in there. And I'm Michelle. Oh, and that's hustle over everything. <laughs> Peace, y'all. Peace out. Thank you so much for listening. The conversation continues on our Instagram at 247Hustler. We post very frequently. And be sure to check out our merch at hustleovereverything.co. We have some amazing sweaters, hats, mugs, and a lot more. Lastly, our Proud to Pay program is linked in the description below. Thank you so much for your support. Talk to you next Monday. Peace.